Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 134, I take questions from the chat room, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded October 29th, 2012, episode 134, in the chat room. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the home theater geek. This week's guest geek bailed on me at the last minute. Uh, an unexpected trip came up, and uh, he said he could do it maybe from the Hong Kong airport, but I said, you know what? We don't know how reliable the Wi-Fi is there. Might be good, but we don't really know. And it'll be really loud and and confusing, so uh, we'll just have him on another time. And meanwhile, I thought I'd take today, which I do every few months, to just answer questions from the chat room. So I look forward to doing that. Those of you who are in the chat room already know what the deal is, but uh, those of you who might be listening after the fact, uh, I do encourage you to uh, tune in live. Uh, we're, we record Mondays from 2 to, 3, 2 to 3 p.m. Pacific time, 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern time, and uh, would uh, definitely love to have you along for the recording. You can join us live at live.twit.tv, and you can uh, join the chat room at irc.twit.tv. And for those of you on the East Coast, today is Monday, the 29th of October, and I do hope that you are surviving the storm of the century, the superstorm, Frankenstorm, as it's been called. I hope all of you are safe and sound and uh, someplace where you can have access to the Internet. Might get few fewer questions from the East Coast this today because of that, but uh, I do hope you're all safe and sound. That's the main thing. Okay, so um, I'm just going to get started here. <clears throat> uh, and oh, and by the way, let me before I do, I will say one other thing. If you're in the chat room and you use my chat room handle, which is Scott Wilkinson, S C O T T W I L K I N S O N, all one word run together, uh, it will show up in a different color in my chat client and uh, will draw my eye to it more readily. So uh, that will help me to ferret out the questions that you want to ask and answer them as best I can. So, okay. Thank you, Yoink23. Uh, I did get one here that I see not uh, with that, but uh, nonetheless, uh, Dave Nell or Dav Nell, any relation to Dev Null, uh, <laughs> uh, says that he's running a system consisting of a good subwoofer plus a pair of Creative T40s. I think they sound great, but what do you think? Well, I think if you think they sound great, then they sound great. Uh, this is certainly one thing that uh, speaker reviewers and reviewers of audio products uh, in general have to deal with, which is that there's an awful lot of personal preference involved in particularly audio equipment. Video equipment, we've talked about this on the show with a variety of guests, and video equipment, TVs in particular, can be very carefully calibrated to a well-known reference standard. And that is what I always aim for when calibrating a TV. And most people find that very pleasing. Now, there are those who prefer the TV to be in its super bright dynamic mode as it normally comes out of the box, what we in the business call the torch mode. And, and that's what they prefer. I was visiting a friend yesterday, in fact, who, who prefers his picture to be as bright as possible, primarily because he's got big windows all around the room. It's in a family room, and and during the day, he needs it to be as bright as possible. Okay, well, that's fine. And some people just prefer that look. Okay, that's fine, too. Um, but in terms of whether or not you want to represent what the director intended accurately, then you want to conform to these display system standards. 
With audio, it's a little different because speakers and amplifiers all have something of a sonic signature, and you might like one versus another. So personal preference plays a big part, and which is why I think it's important to go audition audio components before you buy, if you can. Now, that's becoming more and more difficult to do as brick-and-mortar stores get boarded up because people buy online or they go to the brick and mortar store and they listen and then they go buy online. So that doesn't help the brick and mortar store stay in business. Um, so that's, it's, it's a bit of a tricky situation there. I do want you to audition things if you can uh, and find out what you like and what you like is what's most important. Now, uh, what uh, Dav Nell had there is a uh, subwoofer and two, uh, speakers, so he's running a 2.1 system. That's great. Uh, I would make sure that the subwoofer is, the main speakers are crossed over to the subwoofer in such a way that you get a smooth transition without a big dip or bump or something there as the frequencies move from one to the other. Uh, but uh, aside from that, hey, if you like the sound, that is great. Um, Dr. Baltazar is saying 4K at the cinema is insanely nice. I agree. Totally. Uh, as long as they're playing a 4K file. In most cases these days, when you go to the digital cinema and they have a 4K projector, which a lot of them do, our AMC here in Burbank has nothing but Sony 4K projectors. But pr primarily what they're showing are 2K files. That is 2048 by 1080, roughly. Um, upscaled to 4K. And that, you're not going to see as much of a big difference between that and a true 4K file. Uh, if And I, it's difficult to tell. It might even be impossible to tell in some cases whether you're actually seeing a 4K file. Uh, well, if you see a 4K file, you'll know what it is. But beforehand, if you like go, go to the theater and you say, are you playing a 4K file on that 4K projector today? They won't know. Most of them just won't know. So it's very difficult to determine. But when you do see it, it, it does really look fantastic. So uh, I do totally agree with you on that. Uh, how do you know that it's 4K, F Loop says, uh, when the movies they show are distributed and that the movies that are distributed in 4K, you don't, as I just said. And it's difficult to tell. Uh, uh, beforehand, whether or not it is. I'm hoping that uh, The Hobbit, uh, when it comes out, I know that Peter Jackson is filming it at a higher frame rate, uh, 48 frames per second, and and at 4K, and I'm hoping that he will, or the distribu distribution, the distribution company will make a big deal about, hey, it's a, it's a native 4K file uh, at a high frame rate, uh, because that's certainly the way I want to see it, and I'm hoping I get to do that. Um, let's see. Dr. Baltazar also says, it seems the industry calibrates it from the factory nowadays. You pay a premium, but it's worth it. And I think you're talking about TVs, aren't you? Uh, it really, unless it has a THX mode, it's not calibrated necessarily, probably from the factory. Uh, you really do need to get it calibrated and it's worth the money doing it, in my opinion, in most cases. Now, if it has a THX mode, that does conform more or less to these industry standards that I was talking about earlier. So uh, I've found in my reviews of TVs with the THX mode that the THX mode gets you most of the way there, but it doesn't hit it exactly. And it can't because there's no way to know at the factory or the THX facility, the lab, what your environment is going to be like. And you might have a bright environment like my friend has, or it, you might be able to darken the environment. And that has something to do with how the TV should be calibrated. So uh, it's not possible, in my opinion, to really calibrate a TV uh, directly from the factory. Uh, let's see. Rapper's guy says he has a uh, Panasonic GT30 65-inch plasma. Any major difference between that and the new GT50? Uh, I haven't looked at the GT50 myself. I would say there probably isn't a lot of difference. Black level might be a little lower. Uh, I know that Tom Norton at Home Theater uh, has reviewed the GT, uh, the VT50, the high-end VT50. I don't think he's looked at the GT50 either. Uh, I do know that Leo just got uh, GT50, 
And uh, when I am subbing for him, when I'm filling in uh, for the radio show on the weekend of November 17th and 18th, I will actually calibrate his TV. So that'll be my first opportunity to really see a GT50 up close and, and get uh, familiar with it. And uh, so I'll be able to say more about that when I do. Uh, but I wouldn't say there's a tremendous, probably a tremendous amount of difference. I certainly wouldn't dump the GT50 for the, uh, the 30 for the 50 at this point. I don't think there's, it's going to be worth doing that. Uh, <clears throat> Undermind asks, I heard that Dolby Atmos is going to be commercial theater only. Have I heard about any other forthcoming surround standards that might start to make their way into the home, maybe part of the UHD uh, 4K standard? Uh, no, I haven't heard of, of such a thing. I know uh, do, it's true Dolby Atmos is at this point re limited to commercial cinema. So, you know, it's – and I, did, I think eventually it will probably end up in the home. But the problem with putting it in the home is – that it requires a bunch of speakers, and it even requires speakers overhead installed in the ceiling, plus all around you. It makes a great surround experience, but it's expensive, and it's difficult to install, generally speaking, and it probably has a poor spousal acceptance factor, which is probably why it isn't going to be introduced to the home market anytime soon. Regarding UHD, or really what's more technically called Ultra HD, uh, that's a home standard for higher resolution than regular HD, 1920 by 1080. And it's um, 3840 by 2160, exactly twice the resolution of horizontally and vertically, which is good for scaling, right? You've got, you're going to have Blu-ray around for a while and streaming content at, at 1080p, 1920 by 1080, and scaling that or increasing the pixel density or the number of pixels exactly twice in both directions is much easier than going to true 4K, which is 4096 by 2160, which is the um, commercial cinema standard for 4K. So I just wanted to point that out since uh, Undermine did talk about the 4K standard there. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, Alex Olivier is asking if I can recommend a 5.1 speaker set for a college dorm. Well, certainly you need something pretty small in that case. Um, the, the small speakers that I have really liked in the past are from a company called Energy. Uh, it's the Energy Take. I believe the current version is called the Take classic or the one i reviewed some years ago was the take 5.1 it's a 5.1 system and it, it's the, the little satellites are very small but it really sounds remarkably good it's for the money it's it's kind of what i would recommend uh, for such a situation i do not recommend bose and i know a lot of you have heard me say this before but bose uh, spends more money on marketing in my opinion, than they do on actual quality product. And I have not heard Bose speakers that I really like the sound of very much. Their noise-canceling headphones are a different story. I like them very much. The sound quality of when you're listening to music isn't all that great, necessarily. I mean, it's not bad, but it's not really great compared to some others, particularly the PSB uh, M4U2 uh, noise-canceling headphones. But the noise-canceling of the Bose is second to none that I've heard so far. So I use them on airplanes uh, for that more than for the audio quality. Um, yeah, here's Speaking of Bose, here's Ice Cream saying, working, on, working to restore a pair of 1970s Bose 501s, uh, vintage floor-standing speakers. Uh, were Bose better quality in that era than they are today? You know, that's a good question. I, I never owned a pair of Bose myself. I did hear plenty of Bose 901s, which were, they weren't exactly bookshelves, but they weren't floor standers either. They were these weird sort of trapezoidal, pentagonal-shaped speakers with most of the drivers on the angled surfaces that were meant to go into the, on reflect off the wall, and only a single driver, and all of these drivers, by the way, and there were nine of them, Four on one face, four on another face that were aimed at the wall, so they had to be out from the wall a bit, and only one pointing straight out into the room. And so this re direct reflecting 
technology is what 901s were based on. I don't remember the 501s, whether they had that same design philosophy or not. But uh, I do know that the 901s were very well regarded. Everybody loved them. They were in a ton of college dorms, speaking of college dorms. Um, and I rem as, as I recall, I thought they sounded pretty good. In fact, the same friend that I was talking about earlier who just got a new TV in the giant... Uh, oh, there's a picture of him, by the way. The Bose 901 with a single driver in the front and uh, eight drivers in the back uh, that were meant to uh, reflect off the walls. Those single drivers back in uh, the 70s when I was in college uh, were from a company called CTS in Paducah, Kentucky. I remember that very well because my friend and I ordered two pairs of these four-inch, full-range drivers, built them into wooden cubicle cabinets, probably not the best shape for a cabinet, but what did we know? Uh, and made them into car speakers, and we put them in the back of our cars. So that was pretty interesting. Uh, and in fact, I just did a clean out of my garage, and I found those old speakers that he and I built so long ago. Uh, yeah, so there are, the, there are the Bose 901s. And... Uh, uh, you know, I, I suspect they were probably pretty good. I mean, you know, the, uh, we're talking a memory of 30 or more years. So <clears throat> let's see. Knowledge Seeker says, why didn't my rear speaker work while connected to my front connection? I don't know. Should have worked. You know, the speaker doesn't care whether you're whether you're connected to your front or your rear. Um, so couldn't tell you. Let's see, B, BB from CA, I imagine California. Have you ever reviewed the Pioneer VSX 1122 receiver? Uh, no, I haven't, but I generally really like Pioneer amps. That was the other part of the question. I haven't done the 1122 yet, uh, but several people have asked about it, so I probably should take a look at it, take a listen, I should say. And um, uh, in any event, I do generally like Pioneers very much. I have two Pioneer receivers in two different rooms of my home right now. So that just goes to show you. I particularly like the uh, their new digital amps. Uh, they're called D3, might be even D4 now, but uh, their new digital amps that they put in their higher end elite models really sound great. Uh, and even Michael Fremer, who's been on this show more than once, who is a serious analog uh, analogophile, <laughs> um, has reviewed the Pioneer digital amps and liked them. And I wouldn't have expected him to like anything digital. So Mikey likes it. Um, let's see. Uh, UK Man 2012 has a large collection of vinyl. Want to, the best system to listen to them. What turntable and speakers do I recommend? I'm sorry to say I'm not the guy to ask about turntables because I do have a turntable, but I'd never use it. And I don't listen to vinyl. The place to go for that is a website called analogplanet.com, which is Michael Fremer's website. And he is Mr. Analog. He knows analog up and down, right and left, all the way through. So I do recommend that you go to uh, analogplanet.com to read up on turntables because there you'll get... And there's Mike Fremer, in fact, um, with his extensive LP collection... And uh, boy, he knows what he's talking about when it comes to vinyl. So definitely go f go for uh, go for that. <clears throat> Cabo Zone asks if I've seen the Nightmare Before Christmas in uh, 4D. Actually, it's in 3D at the El Capitan. I have not uh, yet, and uh, I do want to see it in 3D. Uh, so I I will probably go see it uh, because uh, that's definitely a good idea. Let's see. Tix asks, does upscaling improve the quality? I was told it did at a store. Not sure if it's true. Great question. Uh, and I would have to say that it depends. It depends on the quality of the upscaler. And this is one of the things I test and most reviewers test when we're reviewing televisions or uh, AV receivers with upscaling capabilities or um, video processors. All of them have the ability to upscale, which is to take... Uh, an image with a fewer number of pixels than your display can handle and add a bunch of pixels 
to make it be the same number as the display has natively. And, you know, just like anything else, some products do it better than others. And so the answer is it depends. Uh, most TVs these days are doing a pretty good job of it, and they have to because there's still standard def content being shown. And especially if you're online uh, and streaming content, that may very well be at uh, 480p or 720p. And uh, so that has to get scaled up in most cases these days to 1080p, 1920 by 1080. And uh, soon it will be another very big concern when we go to 4K. When I was at Cedia last September, we saw the uh, several 4K Ultra HD panels, including LG, which I bring up now because the scaling was really problematic. They were showing some scenes of, um, I think they were aerial scenes of, uh, of Pacific, Pacific Ocean islands, little islands with coastlines, and then closer up shots of of huts with thatched roofs. Now that's terribly difficult to render well because the thatch roofs have very fine detail in them. And when they got upscaled, and they told us that they were upscaling Blu-ray 1080p, boy, those thatched roofs were just alive with buzzing and twittering and twitching. And some of the coastlines too looked like they had a lot of jaggies in them, which was clearly due to the upscaling. So it's not a foregone conclusion that it's always a good idea. Uh, Web3823 in the chat room agrees that Bose 501, 601, 901s, especially the early series, are very enjoyable speakers. I seem to recall that they were good, so I'm glad to, that Web3823 uh, kind of agreed with me on that. Uh, let's see. Familiar, am I familiar with Walcott Audio? Henry Walcott, an old timer in the industry, sold a pair of speakers in the $6,500, $7,500 range. Gimmick or genius? I don't know. I actually hadn't heard of him before, but, uh, you've given me a good idea. I'm going to go look and research that and, uh, possibly get him on the show. If, uh, what he's doing seems more genius than gimmick. <laughs> I think that's a very good question there. Um, that uh, it would be, it would be, uh, some people are, are kind of gimmicky and I try not to get them on the show. Uh, I try to get people who really have some technical depth to what they're doing and what they're talking about. Uh, even if it is a, a product that they're trying to sell, uh, and I want this show to be more uh, informational than advertorial, if you know what I mean. So, uh, and sometimes I succeed better than others. I try always to, to be more informational, but often there's going to be a, somebody on the show who has a product that they want to promote. Like next week um, I, is going to be Paul Darby from Darby Vision, who has made a new video enhancement processor, uh, which is very interesting and has some uh, new interesting technologies in it. So I'm going to bring it to you. Uh, they just sent me one. I haven't plugged it in yet, but I'm going to try it out, too, before the show so I can get a sense of whether it's more genius or gimmick. I suspect, like most, it'll be a series of both. <clears throat> um, let's see here. Getting a bunch of questions, and I'm sorry if I don't get to yours. I will certainly uh, do the best I can here. Uh, Ice Cream is asking, what's my opinion of the current state of plasma displays? Uh, per he he or she purchased one 18 months ago and felt that it was better quality picture than LCD. Uh, will LCD, LED backlit LCD, surpass plasma in top-notch image quality? My opinion, not at all. I think plasma is still the best uh, flat panel technology you can buy. It's not as bright as LCD or particularly LED LCD. My primary argument here is... LCD TVs have incorporated a number of fixes to problems that they have inherently. LED backlighting, particularly with local dimming, solves the contrast problem that LCDs have. Um, frame interpolation at 120 hertz or 240 hertz uh, and its related technology called uh, backlight flashing, which takes which basically turns off the backlight for half of each frame or some portion of each frame, uh, solves the motion blur problem. 
Well, plasmas don't have these problems to begin with. They simply don't have the problems. So I find them much easier on the eyes, much better performers generally. Now, they aren't as bright. So if you're in a very bright room, then it can be a problem. But it's not as big a problem as a lot of people make out. I was talking with Leo on the radio show this weekend, this past weekend. And he said, you know, he's got two plasmas in his in his place. And he said they're they're plenty bright enough, even during the day, uh, which I agree with. I generally think that that's true. You know, if you have a bright window right behind you that's shining right on to the screen, then maybe an LCD might be a better choice. But if you're interested in ultimate picture quality from a flat panel, it's still plasma. No question about it. No question in my mind, anyway. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Diogenes is asking if I could make a special when I calibrate Leo's system. Uh, yes, I could. Um, and as a matter of fact, that's actually a good idea. I'm going to be doing... Uh, home theater geeks from the twit studio on november 19th because i'll have been there for the weekend prior doing the radio show and uh, you're giving me the idea which i had, don't know why i didn't think of before to uh, maybe talk about that talk about my calibration of his system on that show that wouldn't involve a guest uh so and since i'm doing this now it would be kind of soon but uh, let me think about that if not then some other time certainly um Old Geek, is there an app or website to plot an individual's Fletcher Munson curve? Wow, that's a great question. For those who don't know, the Fletcher Munson curve is the profile of how humans generally perceive are sensitive to audio frequencies from low to high. And it's not flat, which is uh, one argument against having a flat reproduction audio reproduction system. No, I don't know of any app or website that will plot that for you. Really what you're talking about is an audiogram, which needs to be done by a, a medical professional called an audiologist. And now I, I recommend that you do this. You go to an audiologist, you say, I want to get an audiogram of my hearing profile. Even if you're a youngster, uh, oldsters like me, you know, will have a, a more problematic profile because as we age our hearing changes and gets worse we particularly lose high frequencies there may be a notch of of sensitivity of less sensitivity in the three to four kilohertz range uh, which is often due to uh loud noise exposure. And I know I was exposed to loud noise as a teenager and a college student. I played in rock bands and were, you know, standing right up there next to those giant speakers that were really blasting. And uh, I, I'm probably paying for it now. And that's part of the insidious nature of noise-induced hearing loss, which is why I recommend so much that people protect their hearing, even youngsters, because it doesn't show up for 20 or 30 years. The damage that you do as a kid when you go to these loud rock concerts. So I can't stress it strongly enough. Uh, really protect your hearing now because you will be glad you did down the line. But you have to go to an audiologist to get that plot. And even if you're young, I do recommend you get it as a baseline so that you know what your good hearing profile is so that 20 or 30 years from now you can do it again and you can compare it and you can say oh look i lost uh i lost uh, some sensitivity in the three to four kilohertz range or i've lost everything above 15k or whatever um, but you'll know you'll have some some sense the bad news is there's nothing can be done about it except wearing hearing aids which i'm not ready to do yet that's for sure <clears throat> Uh, Lawn Dog asks, doesn't a TV need to be burned in for a while before doing a proper calibration? And also, each TV can have individual characteristics. Uh-oh, that just jumped out at me, jumped after me. This uh, Here we go. Um, each each uh, TV has individual characteristics that need to be calibrated for each TV after all the components have equalized. Yes, that's exactly true. Uh, I generally let, and it's more true of plasma than it is of LCD. I don't really worry about burning in LCDs, and I don't, uh, burning in might be the kind of a wrong term, although you kind of use it for speakers too. But in any event, LCDs don't have the same problem that plasmas do because plasmas are based on phosphors, just like old CRT TVs. 
Uh, in the old CRT TVs, um, an electron beam struck a series of phosphors, excited them, caused them to glow. Similarly, in a plasma TV, the, little, the gas inside the tiny little cell of each RGB subpixel uh, gets excited, uh, ionizes, turning into a plasma, hence the name of the technology. And when the ions recombine to form neutral atoms, they emit an ultraviolet photon, particle of light, which excites the phosphor to glow, red, green, or blue. Now, those phosphors do need a little time to settle in. So I like to have a to run a plasma TV for a hundred hours or so uh, before doing any serious calibration, and that's another reason why uh, when you're talking about individual TVs, another reason why even if they calibrated them at the factory, it wouldn't be exactly correct because each TV does have individual characteristics. There are what are called tolerances, uh, and so the different electronic components. Uh, and the gap spacing here and there might be a little different from one to another. And as long as it's within a certain percentage of tolerance, uh, then it's, it's okay and it, it can be released. But that's why when I do reviews, and most of us that do reviews, we publish the settings that we get when we calibrate a TV. But we also try to make sure, I certainly always try to emphasize that if you use these settings that's on, for, that I got, it's only a starting place because A, my environment is probably different than yours. My review environment is a black hole room and very few people have a black hole room. But B, there are also sample to sample variations. And so the right brightness and contrast settings for the, for the TV that I happen to get in the box might be a little different from the one that you happen to get because of these tolerances, sample to sample variations. So that's another reason not to take our settings, the reviewer's settings, absolutely. Use them as a starting point. But even if you just, re if you just adjust the basic user controls, brightness, contrast, color, tint, sharpness, uh, you might get slightly different uh, values than I do because your TV might react a little differently. So I always recommend that you go and get a disc like the Spears and Munsell um, High Definition Benchmark or Joe Kane's Digital Video Essentials uh, HD Basics is the Blu-ray version and do those settings yourself because you'll get a better result than if you just take my measurements for a different TV. Um. Old Geek is correct that uh, is, is, has got a good idea here, too. Doing a know-how on calibrating Leo's TVs or, more generally, how to calibrate or set up your TV. Uh, I couldn't really do a show on true calibration because that requires pretty extensive training and very expensive equipment. And so, you know, that's not something I could really teach you in a one-hour show or even a tiny segment of a one-hour show, which is what it would be. But I could show you how to set up the for those five controls, brightness, contrast, color, tint, sharpness. And I'm hoping Leo will uh, will let me do that at some point. I do, am, I do look forward to that. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Midnight Rider is asking, I'm going to be purchasing a TV from Costco. I have three models to choose from. One is the LG... Uh, 60 LS5 5750 edge lit. One is a sharp uh, LC60 C6400 edge lit. And the last one is the Samsung UN60 EH6050 backlit. Um, which one would you get? Well, that's easy. I would get the Samsung. And the reason is that the Samsung, as you point out, has LEDs. They all, they all use LEDs for their, for their backlight. But the LG and the Sharp have the LEDs around the edge. I'm, I'm not 100% sure about the Sharp. I'm pretty sure it's true. You say it's edge lit. I'll take your word for it. Um, so they have the LEDs around the edge of the screen, whereas the Samsung has LEDs behind the screen. Why do I prefer LEDs behind the screen? Because of, of a property called uniformity. LEDs around the edge of the screen 
it's very difficult to make the light uniform. And this is particularly evident in dark scenes. So if you watch a lot of science fiction uh, and you've got outer space scenes, that's very dark. Or if you're watching a 235 movie, a, a very widescreen movie, you have black bars on the top and bottom, letterbox bars. And on edge lit displays, there's a very common problem, which is you see it's, it's called a, a floodlight uh, or spotlight, spotlighting, because it looks like there's a spotlight in the corners that make the corners lighter than the center of those black bars. Uh, and there are other other problems, too. The way that an edge lit LCD uh, does it is that it has a special light guide plate behind the screen. And this plate directs the light from the edges, brings it in from the sides or from the top and bottom, and then angles it so it comes through the LCD uh, panel and creates the image. But it, it's very, very difficult to do that well. And I have yet to find an edge lit LCD TV that does it so well that you that you don't notice that there's some uniformity problems. The Samsung EH5000 and 6000 uh, have LEDs behind the screen in an array, and that makes it much more uniform, especially in these dark scenes. Now, in, in backlit LCDs, LED backlit LCD TVs, most often you have a feature called local dimming, which I mentioned a little earlier. And you have the LEDs behind the dark parts in a scene get dim, and the LEDs behind the bright part of the scene get brighter. This makes the contrast, increases the contrast that you see and improves the black level. Generally very, a very good thing, but it's expensive. And the Samsung EH5000 and 6000 series are, they're, entry-level TVs, so they are not expensive. And therefore, they do not implement local dimming. Uh, sharp backlit LCD TVs also do not implement local dimming, most of them. I think a few of the new ones do, but for the most part, they don't. Still in all, it improves uniformity, which is why I prefer it. So I definitely recommend the, uh, the Samsung EH6050 in this case. Uh, to to either of the other two. So let's see. You know what? Before I go on, I do want to uh, thank one of our sponsors for this episode, uh, which, of course, is Netflix. They have been a longtime sponsor of Home Theater Geeks, and I do appreciate that very much, especially since I use the service myself. With, uh, with Netflix streaming, of course, you, you can watch thousands of TV episodes and movies, directly on your TV or your PC, your smartphone, your tablet. Uh, you can get this content from a standalone streamer like a Roku or from a Blu-ray player, from a game console. Just about any consumer electronics product that you can think of will have a Netflix app on it, and you can connect it to your TV and watch as much streamed content from this vast library of stuff uh, which I do all the time. I use it to catch up on uh, TV shows that I haven't seen in a while that I really like or uh, or movies that I might not have on disc and all for one low monthly fee. So it's it's really quite a good deal that I enjoy very much. You can even start on one device and finish on another, which makes it the ultimate inconvenience. Now, for those few of you who might not already have Netflix streaming, you can try it for free for 30 days by going to netflix.com slash twit. And be sure to use that URL, which is netflix.com slash twit. And we thank Netflix again for their support of Home Theater Geeks and the entire Twit Network. Um... So let's see here. We've got a lot of stuff in the chat room about uh, bows. <laughs> uh, Web6303 is asking, why don't TVs come calibrated from the factory? I already answered that question. Uh, it's, it's almost impossible to do. Uh, although I will say this before I get to bows again. The other reason is that when TVs are shipped from the factory, they're shipped to a retailer typically. And at least in a brick-and-mortar retailer, 
they are like Best Buy, say. They are one of them is picked at random from the stock and taken out of the box and put on the showroom floor. And when it's on the showroom floor, the requirements are very different than when it's in your home. The TV needs to be as bright as humanly possible and as blue as humanly possible in order to compete with all the other TVs that are on the showroom floor and attract your eyeballs to them. Now, of course, most of us don't live on a showroom floor with bright lights overhead and a bunch of TVs in a big array. So we don't want that to be in our home. And yet many people live with it because they don't know any better. I will say that the more recently, more modern TVs have a, uh, when you first turn them on, they have a question. They ask you a question. They say, is this going to be in the store or is this going to be in the home? And when you get at home, you just answer it's going to be at home. And things get toned down to some degree, but not enough generally. Uh, so I recommend when you do that, even when you say, yes, it's going to be in a home, that you go into the menu and if you do nothing else, pick the movie or cinema mode. There's, there's a, something called a picture mode in virtually all the picture menus of all the TVs that you can buy. And if you go in there and you pick movie or cinema mode, whatever it's called, that will be closest to the correct colors, the correct uh, brightness, uh, the correct contrast and brightness settings. They probably won't be exactly correct. And I still recommend that you go and get a setup disc like Spears and Munsell or Joe Kane uh, and set those controls for yourself. But it'll be closer than the store mode, which is the torch mode. No doubt about that. Um, okay, so let's see here if I can find my um, Bose, another Bose question here. Uh, one to, oh, Lawn Dog is saying, I had a demonstration room with a Bose cubes and Infinity cubes, side-by-side -side comparison. The Infinities, Infinities were much more spatial, provided better imaging than the Bose. Uh, it's not often that, they're put, that they put two systems side-by-side. -side. Well, that's true. And, and that's a great thing. If you, can, if you can find a place that'll do that, that's even better than simply auditioning one system. If you can, you know, switch between two different ones, you can really hear the difference between them. Uh, I think that's a great idea if you can do it. I think that opportunity is becoming less and less common. Um, Tefman is asking, do I think there's a burn-in period for headphones, in-ear monitors? I think there probably is, as there is for speakers. Speakers also, like and headphones, have diaphragms that move. And when they're brand new, their movement, the material hasn't kind of worn in at all. And I suspect that after, you, you need to run them a bit uh, for, for, their, for the material, the vibrating material, the physical motion to... Um, Settle down is, what, is the term I was looking for. Speaking of which, by the way, in terms of burning in or uh, letting a plasma settle down, settle in the, the phosphors, what you want to do in that case is display a, what's called a full frame, full field, 16 by 9 image. It doesn't have to be a burn-in DVD. A lot of people say, oh, yeah, got to get a burn-in DVD, which will display special patterns that exercise all the phosphors equally. There's nothing wrong with doing that, but it's not necessary. All you have to do is mostly tune in HD channels with full screen 16 by 9 images. You want to avoid channels like CNN or Bloomberg that have a, a ticker running across the bottom because that's going to be a static element. Even though the ticker itself is moving, that area of the screen is stationary and static more or less. So you want to avoid that. You want to change the channels now and then because most channels these days have a bug in the corner, one corner or another, and that stays there. It's stationary. You want to avoid stationary images as much as you can. Um, but don't get paranoid about it. Uh, don't freak out about it. Just watch 16 by 9 HD content and change the channels once in a while, and you'll be just fine, and you'll enjoy yourself. Uh, <clears throat> Let's see. Teclas is asking if I know anything about Bel Canto as a brand. Yes, they make uh, very high-end audio products. I, I can't say I know that much about them. Uh, that's really an audiophile brand, uh, two-channel, and I'm more of a multi-channel kind of guy. So 
that, uh, that I know of the company, certainly, and they make very high-end stuff, very highly regarded stuff, but I don't know that much about them. I don't have any of that equipment. I don't, haven't really spent much time with it. Okay, Remog is asking about Sennheiser HD 555 headphones, uh, which the drivers are in awesome shape, he says, but uh, everything else is kind of beat up. Is it worth fixing? Well, I have a pair of Sennheiser open-air headphones myself, and I have replaced the ear pads several times. So the ear pads are easy to replace, and definitely it's worth replacing them. The other parts, the, the plastic casing and so on and so forth, may or may not uh, be worth replacing. I would guess probably not. Uh, on the other hand, if they're still sounding good, who cares what they look like? Um, and as long as they're still sounding good and they're structurally relatively sound, they're not like actually falling apart, uh, I wouldn't worry about it. But the ear pads certainly can be replaced, and I've replaced mine quite a number of times. Um, Lawn Dog asks, what are my thoughts on 24-bit digital audio? Uh, it's far superior, but will it take hold in the marketplace? Well, here we get to the whole question about uh, high quality versus convenience. Now, 24-bit audio, CDs, for those of you who don't know, you are encode audio in 16-bit words and at a sampling rate of uh, 44.1 thousand times per second. And that's CD quality audio. MP3, of course, takes that and reduces it by as much as 90%, uh, making it not sound as good. But MP3 has taken over the market and, and its ilk uh, because it's so convenient and it requires so much less bandwidth to download and to store on an MP3 player. So what about going in the opposite direction, uh, going to 24-bit words and higher sampling rates? Partic the most common one these days above 44.1 is 96. And that does sound better. There's no question about it but it takes more bandwidth to download and to store. So will people, will people uh, accept it? I, they do already. There are a number of websites that you can download that quality of audio from. Uh, hdtracks.com comes to mind. iTracks, which is I-T-R-A-X.com. HDtracks is tracks spelled normally. Uh, both of those sites uh, offer 2496 downloads. Uh, which really sound great. They they sound amazing. Um, and if, you know, I, I don't think they're going to go away, but whether or not they will capture the mainstream, I would tend to doubt it uh, because most people don't take the time to listen carefully. They're using music as a background to, to doing something else. So it doesn't matter if if it's MP3 quality or not. It's just you know, it's just in the background, so it, it doesn't matter. Those of us who listen to music seriously and carefully, uh, it really does make a difference. And we will continue to make 24-bit, 96 kilohertz uh, audio. Um, it'll still be there. Uh, <clears throat> Beatmaster, thank you so much, is complimenting me on balancing information and spin control. <laughs> I try. My goal here with all of my home theater geeks podcasts and my time on Leo's radio show and my writings online are all about giving you, giving consumers the best information I can. Uh, and so that's what I'm trying to do here. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Beatmaster. Let's see. Do I have any recommendations on where to purchase a replacement driver for a powered subwoofer? Ooh, that's tough. I, I don't. Uh, there are some uh, speaker component companies that will sell you individual drivers and and crossover circuits and stuff like that if you want to build your own speakers. There is a fairly thriving DIY marketplace for building your own speakers. I'm not into it, so I don't really know. Um, I guess my first recommendation would be to go to the manufacturer. If you've bought a you know, a Velodyne or a shoe or a, some subwoofer, I'd, I would first go to the manufacturer and see if they'll sell you a driver. They probably won't. Uh, they'll probably want you to send it in and, and they'll replace it, or they might have a tech repair depot in your area that you could take it to. Um, 
But that's a that's a tough one. I don't know of any place that'll do that. Uh, let's see, Aaron. Uh, let me just double check here. Aaron B loves the 901s. They're just finicky. That's that's true. They do. They're finicky in terms of uh, these are the Bose speakers again. They're tr- finicky in terms of where you place them in the room. You need to put them in a corner, but not right up against the corner. You need to be away from the corner a little bit because a lot of a lot of uh, the sound is needs to get reflected off the wall. Uh, Techless is asking, do I think super high end speakers like the Wilson Audios are worth the money? Yes, I do. And I'll tell you a story that says exactly why. I've told this, I told this story even last week, I think. But those of you who might not have been here, uh, I'll tell it again because it's an interesting story. Years and years ago, long before I was actually in this business, I went to a stereophile hi-fi show in L.A. And it was in a hotel down by the airport, down by LAX. And like all these shows, the manufacturers all set up their equipment their newest products in hotel rooms. And you go into the hotel and you walk down the hall and you go into this room and that room and they've got their speakers and their electronics and their everything set up and you sit and you listen and you say, wow, that's really great. Or you leave screaming from the room. Most of the time it sounds pretty good. So I remember walking down the hallway and I hear music come out of a room. Not a, Nothing unusual there. There's music coming out of all the rooms. But here's this music coming out of this room. And I remember my first thought so clearly. It was, what are they doing with live musicians in there? Now, keep in mind that I'm a professional musician. And in fact, most of the music I listen to is live music. uh, When I listen, you know, recreationally. And so I thought my first thought was, why do they have live musicians in there? This is an audio show. Well, they didn't have live musicians, of course. It was Wilson Audio. It was the Wilson Audio Room. And those were incredibly expensive speakers. I forget which ones they were. Uh, But they fooled my ear, my trained ear. So, yes, I do believe that they are worth it. Now, I'll tell you another story about Wilson that that illustrates this point from another direction. I did a profile once of a a guy who had a a super high-end listening room in Florida. And he had a pair of Wilson speakers, really big ones. I forget which ones they were again, but they were really big. They cost $120,000 a pair. And, you know, he was very enthralled with them. He thought they were really great. His room was all totally acoustically um, treated. He, in fact, recorded the symphony, his local symphony, when it played. And then he brought the tape home and immediately listened to the concert again, sitting there listening to his Wilson speakers and undoubtedly really expensive electronics as well. And he was, he thought they were great. Okay, fine. Well, that same week, I went to a fundraiser in Los Angeles for a battered women's shelter whose annual budget was $120,000. Now, this is many years ago. But it just brought into such stark contrast, you know, some some people are, are able to spend $120,000 on a pair of speakers Whereas other very worthy causes take that much money and spread it out over a year to help battered women in this case. Uh, It was just quite a stark contrast. Um, And yet, you know, if you can afford it uh, and and audio is your passion, I, I think they are worth it. Now, I will also say that if you look at a graph of price to performance... It, it goes up in a nice diagonal line, as you would expect. You spend more, you get better performance. Performance is on the vertical, price is on the horizontal. It gets, as you spend more, you get better performance. Better performance, better performance. But at some point, that curve tends to flatten out. And so what I, and so that you spend 10 times more money, you might get 10% better performance. I liken this also to particle physics, in which... You try and accelerate particles up to the speed of light, and it takes so much energy near the speed of light. It takes so much energy to get to 50% the speed of light, and then it takes 10 times more energy to get it 10% faster. So as you get higher and higher and higher in energy consumption or price, the amount of impact of performance improvement gets less and less. And so in the price performance curve, I look for that what's called the knee 
where the curve starts to flatten out. And that area, that point right there where the curve starts to flatten out is where I think the best price performance ratio generally is. So that is what I think about all of that. That's a lot of things to say about whether or not super expensive speakers are worth it. Um, let's see. Aaron B is asking, what disc do I like for calibration, DVD Essentials or the Bob Kane one? Actually, DVD Essentials is the Joe Kane one. It's Joe Kane, not Bob. Um, and I like that one very much. But it's uh, And the HD Basics, the Blu-ray, has a pretty good menu system. Personally, I generally tend to use the Spears and Munsell one, uh, which is called High Definition Benchmark, because it has its patterns uh, that, that it has, especially for setting contrast, I happen to like better than the ones on Digital Video Essentials. It's not that the Digital Video Essentials ones are bad. It's just I, my personal preference. I like the, uh, I use what's called the clipping pattern on Spears and Munsell um, HD benchmark to set the contrast because it has uh, a particular area of the pattern which goes above white. I should explain this. Uh, there's uh, black, black to white on a video display is done in eight bits. It's eight digital bits are used to represent the gray levels from black to white. And you might think it goes from 0 to 255, but it doesn't. It goes from 16 to 235. That is the defined range of black to white in video. And yet some content, some movies, have information above that 235. So we call it above white. Similarly, there's an area below black, below a value of 16. And it's important to me, in my opinion... There are differing opinions on this, but it's important to me to be able to see that that information above white because it does exist, even though it's technically not supposed to, but it does. So that's why I like that disc, that particular pattern, because it has that above white information in it that lets me see whether or not I've set the contrast to the point where that information is clipped out or whether it's visible. Okay, well, I got a ton more questions here, but, you know, there's an, actually another sponsor this week that I would like to tell you about. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome a new sponsor to our show, which is called Bespoke Post. Now, if you've never heard of Bespoke Post before, it's a product subscription service for men. And I have to say, probably most of you watching are men. For you women in the audience... Might be a good gift idea for the man in your life. Each month, Bespoke Post sends you an exclusive package called the Box of Awesome with products ranging from gadgets to accessories to um, grooming products and more. And you can check it out by going to bespokepost.com slash twit. That's B-E-S-P-O-K-E post. Dot com slash twit. You sign up now and receive 20% off your first month subscription of $45. What it works, it works like this. You subscribe for 45 bucks a month, and each month they send you a different box of awesome, which might have, uh, as I said, grooming products, or uh, uh, there one, one month it was a coffee stuff. Uh, there might be mixed drinks kind of features. Each one is themed in a particular way. It looks very interesting, and uh, I'm actually waiting for my first box of awesome now, which I'll tell you about another time when I get it. But uh, it's it's really quite an interesting service, so I do recommend it uh, that you check it out at least. Uh, just uh, You can save 20% off your first box by going to bespoke.com slash twit. That's bespoke.com slash twit. And I'll have more to say about that. Uh, as you can see on the website, it says, become a gentleman one box at a time. It's high quality stuff. And uh, so I do recommend that you uh, at least check it out. Okay, we got a few minutes left. So we're going to go to another couple of questions. Let's see here. Uh, yes, SoCal Ray Jr. is correct. Uh, Spears and Munsell has a new disc, new test disc coming out before the end of the year. 
Uh, ooh, you spent some time with Stacy Spears. I believe it's going to have a lot of 3D content on it, too. So that's very cool. Oh, very good. Web 841. What about the Disney Wow calibration disc? Very good disc. I like that disc a lot, especially for people who aren't as deeply into the technical end of things as I am and some of us are. But if you're not, it's great for newbies and people who just want to set up their TV. It's actually really, really good. It's uh, uh, very extensive. Plenty of explanations of how to do things and why to do things. I do recommend it very highly. The Disney Wow Disc. I thank you very much, Web841, for bringing that up. Because that is another one that's really, really good. Uh, Web3823, how, long, how long does a typical TV, uh, typical HDTV calibration take me? Mm, I'd say anywhere from an hour to three or four, depending. If I have to do a 3D calibration as well as a 2D, then that obviously takes a lot longer. But uh, just doing a good 2D calibration, I can usually do it in, uh, usually in an hour or two, uh, sometimes a little longer. Uh, let's see. Any idea, any idea why they went with edge-lit LCD for the 84-inch 4K panel? Because edge-lit... Edge lighting makes it possible to make the panel thinner. And that seems to be a form factor that is people really want. So I personally would rather see edge lit myself, especially on such a large screen. Absolutely. No question about, about that. Um, let's see. Techless. Uh, how important is it for all speakers in a surround system to be the same? I think it's very important. Uh, I think that the tonal balance as a sound pans from one speaker to the other, needs to be the same. So it needs to at least be from the same manufacturer in the same series of speakers. If you mix and match uh, JBLs with B&Ws, with others, uh, you're going to get a mishmash, and the sound as a helicopter goes from one side of the room to the other is going to change, and you're going to notice that, and it's going to take you out of the, out of the immersion. Uh, Reverb Mike, why do TVs have such lousy names? Uh, yeah, you know, model numbers are weird. UN55 ES8000 or KDL55 EX720. Now, you can learn what they mean. It, it actually, they actually have some meaning. For example, the UN55 ES8000 Samsung, the 55 refers to the screen size. The UN refers to the fact that it's ultra thin, which means it's LED, it's edge lit. And E in the ES8000 refers to a 2012 model. They started with A, and now they're at E, and they've got a long way to go. I don't know why they went with ES, to tell you the truth. And 8000, that's just their, their, I think that's the top of the line. I don't think there's a 9000. There might be. Anyway, in the case of the KDL, uh, Sony KDL EX, 55 EX720, again, the 55 refers to the screen size. KDL uh, is just Sony's code for an LCD TV, and EX720 is the series. Um, Joel H., can I suggest a good video projector for projecting ghosts around a semi-dark room? Ooh, for Halloween, cool. Um, any, any video projector will do it, I, I, and it'll only be in the direction that the projector is facing. That's kind of an interesting idea, isn't it? Having a projector with different lenses that shoot off in different directions. Be like, kind of like a planetarium. I don't know of any such, any such device. Um, let's see. Beatmaster is asking about speakers with built-in calibration. Uh, subwoofers get that. So there are some subwoofers, for example, Velodyne, that, that have some built-in calibration. Uh, again, it's a matter of your environment more than anything else. And uh, the only other kind of speaker that could do automatic calibration is a powered speaker. That is a speaker with an amplifier built in. Now, receivers have built-in calibration for your passive speakers. Uh, com comes from a company called Odyssey or uh, Trinov. Uh, Yamaha and Pioneer have their own proprietary ways of doing that. So there is automatic calibration, but it's not in the speakers. It's in the AV receiver. <laughs> okay, I have been uh, informed by my faithful engineer, John, that time has run out. So I want to thank everybody for uh, posting so many great questions in the chat room. Sorry, I didn't get to everything, but it was ever thus. 
Uh, next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be Paul Darby, as I mentioned before, who has made the Darby Darblet, the video enhancement processor that I'm going to be trying out next week. Uh, and I'll be able to speak intelligently about it with him. Uh, so I do hope you will join me for that. You can, Meanwhile, you can reach me at scott at twit.tv, and you can read what I'm writing these days on secrets of home theater and high fidelity at hometheaterhifi.com. So until next week, when I hope Paul will be here, but in any event, I'll be here, and I hope you will too. Until then... Geek out.